Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Today we're gonna con we are going to continue with the topic of indifference curves uh, and specifically the shape of indifference curves. So last time I told you uh, what the shape looks like of the indifference curve. Again, make sure you remember an indifference curve is a curve that represents all possible bundles of goods X1 and X2 that's gonna leave me equally happy. If you're not comfortable with, with what an indifference curve is or what the bundles on indifference curve means, go review the link on the top right. So given the fact that we are indifferent uh, between all the combination of different bundles, now we're gonna talk about why the curve looked the way it did in the previous uh, lecture. So if you take two bundles, uh, x1 comma x2, and we increase uh, one of the go goods with a little bit, which is x1 plus delta x1, which means x1 changes by a small amount, uh, comma x2 plus delta x2. So again, we have looked at this representation. Uh, if you're not comfortable with what delta x1 means, it just means change in x1. But if you're not comfortable with this notation, uh, go click on the link on the top right again. So if you're indifferent between these bundles, then the slope, uh, which is the shape of the indifference curve, uh, between these two points is going to be a straight line. And if, you, if this delta x1 and delta x2 are small enough, then the slope uh, between these two bundles is just going to be change in x2 over change in x1. And this is a ratio uh, which you should have seen before. We've talked about this on the graph uh, where we have x1 and x2, right? So you have x1 and x2 on, the, on this graph that we've talked about before. If you look at this ratio, uh, this is just the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the whatever the variable is on the x-axis. So when we talk about the indifference curve, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a second. It's a slope of this line given by this ratio, all right? So make sure you understand uh, what, it, you know, what, what it means uh, to have the slope of the indifference curve. And then a very important concept is called the marginal rate of substitution uh, between x1 and x2, which is how much of x2 I'm willing to give up to get one more unit of x1, and very importantly, leave me equally happy, all right? So uh, one thing, if you look at the, so when we're talking about the shape of the uh, indifference curve, uh, Motoronic preferences tells us that if I am going to be equally happy, if x1 is going to go up, x2 must go down. Or if x1 is going to go down, x2 must go up. So the sign of the slope will always be negative. Hence the shape of the indifference curve is the way I drew it last time, which is negatively sloped. Because every point on this line leaves me equally happy, which means if I get more of x1, I have to give up x2 to be equally happy. Therefore, it's downward sloping. This next question is, why does it look the way it does? Why is it curved the way it is? And this goes back to the concept of uh, diminishing uh, uh, rate of substitution, which again, click on the link if you're not comfortable theoretically. Now we're just putting it all graphically. Let's pick some points. So if you are uh, increasing a consumption of x1 from one to two, so let me uh, explain to you before I draw it. Uh, what we said uh, was that we like to have some of both goods and not one, you know, a lot of just one good. So the example of water and food I'll go back to, uh, which was, uh, which I told you to pay attention to in the next time you ate your meal, is to look at the, look at the substitution between how many helpings of water and how many helpings of food uh, that you're eating. So let's say you go from one to two, the amount of X2 you're willing to give up is going to be this much. Right, so going from bundle A, let's say, to bundle B, to get one more unit of X1, I'm going to be willing to give up that much X2 and be equally happy. Let me pick another two points. If I want to go from, let's say, five to six unit of X1, now the amount of X2 that I'm willing to give up becomes smaller. So just understand that graphically, how that's true. Now let me explain to you theoretically why, why that's true. Again, I'm gonna go back to the example of water and food. If I give you, when you're eating a meal and I give you five glasses of water and zero units of food, then to get that first plate of food, let's say, uh, you're going to be willing to give up lots of water because you like to have both and not just water. You don't like to fill up your stomach just with water. But as you keep getting more and more plates of food, then the amount of water you're going to be willing to give up becomes smaller and smaller because you want to have some water as well. So if you understand that, uh, it's easy to see that here. To get one more unit or plate of food, uh, helping of food, uh, you are willing to give up a lot of water when you have little food and a lot of water. But to get the same extra plate of food, when you already have lots of food, you're not going to be willing to give up a lot of water. So this concept of the way we substitute goods is 
diminishing, right? So what we say here, and this is a very important uh, concept in this chapter, is that our marginal rate of substitution between x2 and x1 is diminishing, or for each extra unit of x1 that I want to get to leave me equally happy, the amount of x2 I'm willing to give up is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, so you now should be very comfortable with the, the concept of indifference bundles uh, and indifference curve, which is a graphical representation of that. So I've used food and water and genes and clothes as an example to illustrate this point over the last few videos. Uh, but to make sure, uh, you know, let me pick another couple of goods. Let's say you're somebody who likes to eat both chips and chocolates. Right? So if you, if you don't like that, pick two goods which you like to have both. So when you go to the market and you're trying to decide how much of what to buy, you, if, you, if somebody says, I'll give you 10 bags of chips and zero chocolates, and then they say, okay, uh, how much of one good you're willing to give up to get another unit of the other good and be equally happy? To get that one chocolate, you're going to be willing to give up a lot, you know, many bags of chips. But as you keep getting more units of chocolates, the amount of chips you're going to be willing to give up is going to become smaller and smaller. So next time you go to the market and you're buying those goods, think about how much, of, how much more are you willing to give up of the other good to get one more unit of X1. So you're paying for chocolates not with money, but with number of chips you're giving up. So think about that, and hopefully all of this will make sense uh, when you're trying to learn this for your exams.